I, the, uh, for those of us who were in church last Sunday, we spoke about the Resurrection Sunday, and we made one strong emphasis that I shared with you, and that if you forget anything, don't ever forget that, that the resurrection is not an event. Amen. Thank you, son. The, rev the, rev uh, the resurrection... The resurrection is not an event. It's not a place. It's a person. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection life is not an event. It's not a place. It's a person. And the heart of God is for you and for me to continue to experience the resurrection life. We are supposed to live the resurrected life. Paul speaking to us in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. He said, it is no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. He said, the life I live now, I live by my faith in the Son of God, who has crucified himself for me. That is resurrection life. Paul again speaking to us in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 11. He said, if the same spirit that resurrected Christ from the grave, if that same spirit dwells in you, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. That spirit has the capacity to quicken your mortal body, to bring it back to life, to bring it to power with what God intended that body to be. So that my body, your body, the physical flesh that we call body today can begin to function according to the dictates and the direction and the instruction of the Holy Spirit, which is via the Word of God. That is what the resurrection life comes to accomplish. Apart from healing me physically, restoring peace to me, which is part of the kingdom of God, and uh, this is the heart of God. And the resurrected life is a fruitful life. A resurrected Christian is a fruit-bearing Christian. A resurrected Christian is a Christian that lives a life that reflects his master, Jesus the Bible says in the book of Acts, it said the, the apostles or the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch for a reason. It wasn't a title. It was more of a smear campaign in a way, if you like. And that they have not met Jesus. They never saw Jesus. They heard about Jesus. And when they saw the life style of this men and women, they say they act and do things like that Christ that was crucified a few years ago in Jerusalem. What a testimony that they were able to identify them with their master. And the reason being that they were showing forth fruit They were exhibiting the life of Jesus in the flesh. They were living the resurrected life in their marriage, in their home, in, at their place of work. When they were given an assignment, the Bible said, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. They served with joy. Everything about them was a reflection of Jesus. So these people didn't need to see Jesus. When they saw them, they were satisfied. Like Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And that same call is for us today. And for me to be able to live the life of Jesus, I must first of all die. I must die to live. John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth what? Much fruit. Now, the fruit there is singular. It's not plural. For a reason. 
unless a kind of wheat dies, it abides alone. And for you to live, you must die as a child of God. Because for me to be a fruit-bearing Christian, I must first of all die. Because we are called to be fruit-bearers as Christians. John chapter 15, verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that you will bear much fruit and, your, and you shall become what my disciples if you are a fruit bearer. Philippians 1, 11 said, Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Because bearing fruit make your life pleasing to God. John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you should ask of my Father, in my name, he will give it to you. And what Jesus meant by that, the, the name there is not just, because a lot of people are calling the name of Jesus. Jesus said something in the same gospel of Matthew. He said, many will come that day and said, we did this in your name. Because a name, even though there is power and authority in the name of Jesus, but what he's saying here is that whatever you do in my nature, Whatever you do in my nature, in my character, because a name speaks about the nature and the character of the person. And I've said this to you before time and time again. That's why in our culture, even though we didn't have the Bible, we understood that to a large extent. And so you don't just name a child after a movie star. Amen. <laughs> or you don't call a child a name because the name sounds very fancy and nice to the ear. No. You call a name because every time you call a child a name, you are speaking to their destiny and their future. And that's why when somebody like Jabez, when he found out that his name meant sorrow and grief and he was living out that life, he cried out, oh God, that you would change my name. Before God could walk with Jacob, he had to change his name to Israel, a prince with God. Because he was living out his name as a some planter, as a trickster, meaning Jacob. And so when Jesus said, you ask anything in my name, when you begin to bear fruit, when my nature is being reflected in the way you talk, in the way you act, in the way you think, then your life becomes pleasing to God. Because bearing fruit also makes you a joyful Christian. Say, so this thing I have spoken to you, that your joy might be full and remain in me. John 15, 11, Bearing fruit makes you heaven worthy. The gifts are wonderful, but the gifts is for here. The fruit is what you need. The fruit is your ticket to heaven. The gifts are for the Bible says it's for the edification and the building of the body of the church. And that's why Jesus said you can do so many things in my name, heal the sick, operate in the gift, the power gift of the Holy Spirit, and still be cut short. Because it is in the fruit that the Father is pleased. Romans chapter 6 verse 22 said, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it ends what in eternal life. So your fruit is what gives you eternal life. A true Christian should be more passionate about bearing fruit than anything else. Philippians chapter 4 verse 17 has that to say to us, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that might abound to your account. Jesus is always looking for fruits in men, not gifts. 
We saw that in the book of Mark, chapter 11. Very interesting story. I want you to write it down and go read it at home. Mark, chapter 11. And I, uh, that story never stops to intrigue me. Every time I read that story, I go back and forth again, and it just blows my mind and put fear in my heart. The Bible said, if you read that story very well, Jesus, the Bible said in this discourse that even though it was not the season for that fig tree to bear fruit. So in essence, he wasn't doing, looking at that from my own carnal mind, physical eye, then why would you curse it? It's not his time for bearing fruit anyway. Right, but wrong. He had the semblance God used that to teach the church something that we're failing to gain. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Because God is looking for fruit to eat. The world is hungry. Paul speaking to the church in Romans, he said the whole world is groaning in pain, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. How many times have you heard people say, I stopped going to church because I got burnt in the church. I got hurt by the church. I got betrayed by the church. I got, I got hurt by the pastor. I got, you, you, you hear stories. As sad as that is, why did I get hurt by my pastor? Because the pastor had the semblance of the fruit. So when I saw the fruit, I thought it had fruit, and because I was hungry, I went looking for the fruit to eat. And when I got close, I realized that there was no fruit there. So Jesus came to this tree looking for fruit, and there was no fruit. But the tree had the semblance of bearing fruit. I have the, the semblance of being a good Christian. I, I talk the Christian talk. I pray the Christian prayer. I go to church. I had the title of a Christian as a pastor. But do I have fruit? Do I have the fruit in me? When people see me from a distance, I look like a very good man. But when they come close... Is that what they're going to find? When they go to my house, is that what they're going to find? When I leave the church on Sunday morning, is that what they're going to find? When Jesus comes looking for fruit in 12 midnight in my house, what would he catch me doing? Do I have fruit? And we can see some of the fruits in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he said, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, great, uh, gentleness, goodness, and faith. He said, Against such there is no law. Ephesians 5, 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. These are the fruit of the Spirit, some that are essential. Read Ephesians chapter 5 when you get home. I, will, I implore you this week, go read the letters of Paul. Add them to your devotional time. All the letters of Paul, read it. It gives structure and integrity to your faith as a child of God. But how can I bear this fruit. And I struggle with that. And, and Lord, how do I bear fruit? We must show forth fruit in keeping. So Jesus said in John chapter 12, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. So it is in my dying that life of Christ is released. But that death is not done forcefully. It's not done through cajoling. 
And I could understand. I said, Lord, I thank you that I, I, don't, I didn't miss it. That, because you see, the reason why I'm very hesitant in making an altar call, because I understand what an altar means. It's a place of death. It's a place of pure and true sacrifice. We call this altar. We coined it from the Old Testament tradition when people raise an altar to place a sacrifice before the Lord. We must be willing to lay down our lives so that we can live again. And I'm going to illustrate that this morning. And as I saw that yesterday morning praying, this was not part of anything I was thinking about. I was just thinking about the fruit, and the Holy Spirit just took me somewhere that I've never seen before all my life as a Christian, because sometimes we just get caught up in the bad wagon, and there is nothing wrong with that. Not that it was a wrong theology, not that it was a mistake, but there was a picture or something that I've missed all my life, all those years of being a Christian. When I read the story of Abraham and Isaac, we, we glorified Abraham so much. But the Bible said so. But we miss one of the most important character in that story. Isaac. And when the Lord showed me that yesterday, and even thinking about it right now, my heart broke. Isaac. We don't talk about Isaac. When we talk about men of faith, we don't talk about Isaac. But Isaac was the key to the fate of Abraham. And I'm going to show you that literally this morning. As the, you just give me time. Courage, can you go dress up? Can you set up this altar? And I'm going to show you something. With your eyes and my eyes to see something. And I need other children. You guys can come and represent the donkey. Judah, uh, Merv, Merv, you come because you're going to do. You're going to be the biggest servant. You pick this wood. Pick that wood first, uh, Merv. You pick that and put it on your shoulder. Courage. Okay, you guys. This, this children, uh, this man here. The two of them, you guys come, you come, courage, you come. You guys come here. Uh, put it on your shoulder as it's done in the traditional way. And then you guys are following. Uh, you guys follow behind. Uh, they represent the donkey and other things. And let us, let's keep going. Now, this is Abraham. You know the story in Genesis 22. You can write it down and go read the whole story at home. And I'm going to try to illustrate it as, to the best of my ability as I was showing it. Here was uh, Abraham was sleeping, or whether he was praying, and the Lord said to Abraham, 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 take your only son, your only son, the one whom you love, and go sacrifice him for me on the place which I will show you. And Abraham did not argue with God. God said, sacrifice, kill. And so Abraham got servants, two of his servants and the donkeys and everything ready together with everything for a sacrifice because he understood what sacrifice meant. And he began to hold his son's hand and they began to go. They're working to the place. And the Bible says a few days later, he saw the mountain for the sacrifice from afar. And he took the wood from the servant and lay it upon his son's shoulder. You hold it. Now, what does this remind you of? Jesus Christ being led to that same place, which we'll see later. When Jesus, your Lord and my Savior, and you watch the movie and you read the story, when Jesus was going to the cross, his wood was given to him 
But he didn't carry it all the way. You remember that? Somebody, Joseph or some, uh, Ramati or whatever was called, or Simon or Cyrene, I don't know which one of them, was called, and he had to help Jesus with the wood halfway, right? That was what happened. And the same story already happened thousands of years ago, but we didn't see that. We didn't see Isaac being a schoolmaster, teaching us something that was yet to come. And so now Abraham said to the servant, he took the wood and laid it on his own son, the wood that was going to be his deathbed, and put it on his son's shoulder, and said, so let's go. And he said to the servants and the donkeys, you stay here on that mountain. I and my son, we are going up to worship the Lord, and we'll come back. Listen to me. Getting the fruit of the Spirit, you must be willing to let go. If you want to go deeper with God, the hour of separation, a time will come in your life that you need to willingly say no to those friends, no to that habit, no to that anger. You can't continue to tell people, I was born that way. Abraham said, now the time for joke and play is over. Me and my son, we are going up to do business. All the donkeys are the works of the flesh. You stay here, we are going up. And so Abraham and the son, together, and they were climbing onto this mountain, which was going to happen the two thousand or five, yeah, thousands of years later. And they got to this mountain. And here was the principal character, Isaac. And Isaac said to the father, said, I can see the wood for the sacrifice. And I can see the fire. Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Can you imagine the torture? And Isaac said, Abraham said to the son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Now, lie down. Lie down straight. Isaac God will provide, but Isaac, you lie down here. Isaac was not a six-month-old baby. Isaac was not six years old. Isaac was past the age of 12. Abraham was over 90. So Isaac could fight his father over this decision. Isaac would have run away. My father is in saying, you want to kill me? What kind of God? Did mama know about this thing you're about to do? Isaac would have argued and nothing would have happened to Isaac. Isaac would have fought his father and ran back to the valley where the other servants were waiting and said, my father has gone crazy. He wants to kill me. But the Bible said, Isaac lay down and he began to watch his father. Watch this. Got the word. Set the word on the altar. Isaac didn't say a word. His father took the rope just like they would do a lamb for sacrifice on the altar. Bind his son's hand together. And tie his face, because that has to be done so he doesn't see that. Father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Remember Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? The Father has to turn his face because the Bible says Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. It wasn't the Roman soldiers that killed him. And Isaac did not struggle with this old man. Isaac did not argue with this old man. 
tactic did not run away, even though he, it was in his power to do it. He stayed there. And then, the man took the knife, and he couldn't see. He can't see what he was about to do. The pain was too much for him. But it was Isaac that was dying, not Abraham. It was Isaac that was going to die a brutal death. A death that has no meaning or justification. But he stayed there. He stayed there. He stayed there. And as soon as he was about to go through with it, a voice said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand upon him. Merv and Brian, you again. Merv, can you pick that cross again and bring it halfway? And then Brian will bring it to the end. And here was Isaac. Because when you put your sacrifice on the altar, the moment you are ready to go all the way with the Father, then the substitute. Isaac, Abraham said to Isaac, okay, Jesus took the cross. Somebody helped him halfway. But when he got to the mountain top, he brought his cross to the mountain. God will provide himself, what? A lamb for the sacrifice. History made us to understand. You stand here. Please. Stand by the cross, in front of the cross. Isaac was brought to the mountain. Father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? The Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And thousands of years later, we are meant to understand that on that same mountain, so the lamb that was caught in the ticket was not what Abraham was speaking about. The lamb that God was providing himself has nothing to do with the ram that got caught in the ticket. It was this lamb that was coming to take the place of the sacrifice that was not permitted to go through with it. There is a lamb because God intended to make a sacrifice. There was still going to be a sacrifice. There will be a sacrifice upon this mountain. But God wants to know, am I willing to come all the way with him? Because until I'm willing to come to this mountain of sacrifice, only then will I behold and see the lamb. So he said, Jehovah Jireh, it is more than money in the bank. It is the savior of mankind. It is in the sacrifice. It is in the willingness of Isaac to lay down his life without struggle, without crying, that is where fruit is produced. It is not by struggling. I hear people say, God, if God want to take you, is that he takes you by the gentle way, or he will take you kicking and screaming. Today, I repent of those statements. God will never force you. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. If you are willing and obedient, if you are willing to be God's Isaac, God will not, it was said, history will have it said, that when the story came out, Isaac's friend began to ask him, what made you do that? Even when you knew your father was going to kill you. And the Jewish historian have this to say about Isaac. And Isaac said, it would have been better to him it would have been better for him never to have been born than to be born and not do the will of his father. Amen. Jesus said, my will, the will of the father, my meat is to do what? His will. Not my will, but your will, O oh God. This is how fruit is produced. It is in my debt, in my willingness to go forward to God. Are we willing? 
to allow the breaking to happen so that the fruit can begin to show up. Are we willing to let go? And as we look at that, as we look at that picture, Paul began to make you understand something. He uses two phrases throughout his letters. First to the Romans, to the Philippians, to the Colossian church, and every church he keeps talking about two things. Yield. Yield your members. To yield means to surrender without struggle. And they taught us, oh, God, God, God will not strive with you. Isaac did not struggle with his father. Are you willing to surrender, to relinquish your physical control to another? Isaac relinquished when, when the Bible talks about yielding to God. Paul said it to you and me in Romans chapter 12 from verse 1. He said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. And do not be confirmed anymore to the pattern of this world. So for you to be able to come up to this mountain, you must tell the servant, stay down here. Your time is up. I'm about to do business with God. I'm about to yield. Have you yielded to God? What is God still struggling with you? He's not even struggling with you. You're struggling with yourself. That's what I realized. I'm struggling with myself. It's not God struggling with me. He won't struggle. Isaac did not struggle with the father. Just like this boy now. He's about the same height as me now. I can't take him down like when he was six years old. He can struggle now and get away from here if he wants. He didn't struggle. And you think God is struggling with you? God is not struggling with you. God is not fighting with me. I'm the one fighting with myself. Because if I'm not willing to come, I will not see him, my king's man, redeemer. Because on this mountain of sacrifice that God is calling everyone into that higher place, because when you come there, the Bible says now you reckon yourself as dead. To reckon, to, to see yourself as dead. Reckon yourself as dead unto sin. Sacrifice of death. The sacrifice that produces fruit. Unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground, it abides alone. Philippians 2 verse 8, you remember Jesus? He said, even though he was everything God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. He made himself what? Of no reputation. He became obedient unto death, Isaac and Jesus. This one, even the death of the cross. He became obedient. Obedience is the highest form of praise you can offer to your God. Stop being deceived by man and telling you it's okay. It is not okay. You must be willing to die for God to be glorified in you. God wants us to come to the altar. And so when I have the altar here, when we talk about coming to the altar, we're coming to a place of sacrifice by fire. You set it on fire. God wants to set your destiny on fire so that you can live. He said, unless you die, you abide by yourself. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. Right? He said, I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. He said, this command have I received of my father. It is my father that asked me to die, not you, the Roman soldier. And so Jesus said, if any man will follow me, take your cross. I'm not going to force it on you. You take it up and follow me daily. That means prepare your own altar of sacrifice. Where is your own Mount Moriah? 
What do you need to bring to the altar? What do you need to kill today? So that the fruit of God can begin to grow in you. You want to see the fire of God. You want to see the revival. You want to see change in your marriage. You want to see life being transformed around your family. You want your children to start running back to God. Then go to the altar and die. yield to God so that the fruit of righteousness can abide. Thank you. You guys can go and sit down as we pray. Okay, courage. Thank you. This is the story of fruits. I wore him down because Isaac and Jake, uh, and Abraham they had to look different from the servants. So there's a distinction. I, Abraham was a rich man. He was a man of means. And so he can't look the same like his servant. And so the servants were different, but Isaac and his father were dressed in royal robe unto their death. But they laid it all down to the Lord. Before you can yield yourself, you must believe that it is true. Child of God, it is time for you and me to bear fruit. Unless a corn of wheat fall to the ground, he abides alone. Do you want to bear fruit? Do you want to be a fruitful Christian? Do you want to produce life? Do you want to give God the opportunity to shine through you? Do you want the glory of God to begin to emanate out of you? Do you want to bear fruit that people, because fruit is for eating. People are looking for Christians for fruit. Revival comes when there is fruit in me, in my place of work. When people come near me, what do they get? Is it my bitterness, my anger, my resentment, my criticism? Is that the fruit that I'm showing for it? Or is it the fruit of the Holy Spirit in me? Unless a kind of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's a willing thing. It is not by force. There is no kicking and screaming. The Bible said like a sheep that was led to the shearer, he opened up net his mouth. Now, no. 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 The gospel is hard, but it's sweet. Living for Jesus is hard, but it's sweet. Coming to this place of death is going to be the longest journey of your life and my life. But if we step onto that mountain and we die to ourselves, Isaac died that day. Isaac trusted the father to that point. The Bible says, whom the, the father loves, he chastises and he disciplines and, and he, he, he corrects, so whatever word you want to use, but the, the chastening of the Lord, the Bible says in Psalm, he said the chastening of the Lord. God chastens him. Isaac was laid here to die. But he wasn't going to die because God will provide himself a ram for the sacrifice. Paul said, it's no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who has crucified himself for me. I live now by faith in him. I died so that he can live. What do you need to kill? Are you a dead Christian? Or are you a living Christian? Are you still alive? Like I said last Sunday, have you ever been to a funeral where you see the dead man from the cops, you know, begin to complain that it's too warm inside in the casket? Everybody will run out of our place. 
Amen. Huh? Have you ever seen a dead man get angry? No, no, honestly now. Have you ever seen a corpse? And you went, you're viewing the face, and he looks at you and says, I, I hate you. Why did you come to my funeral? Have you ever seen a corpse tell that to anybody? Have you ever seen a dead man talking, even the children that he didn't like? You know what I mean? They, when, when a man is dead, he's dead. You mess him up the way you want. Nothing happens. Amen. Dead. Are you dead or alive? Is your flesh still alive? The anger, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the hatred, the gossiping, the criticism, the adulterous life, the fornication, the sexual promiscuity. When Jesus comes in the night and is looking for fruit, what will he find me watching? on TV. When Jesus comes in the night, when I'm on night duty and nobody is there and he's looking for fruit, what is he going to find? Is he going to find that fig tree blossoming or is he going to say, may no man ever eat of you again? And Jesus will curse that tree because he doesn't want him to continue to deceive other people. Does your life reflect the Christ that you profess? Can we stand up this morning? Can the music t- uh, Come as we sing, I surrender. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. The more I think about Isaac, for once, he is a hero of that story. And Jesus knows it's not easy to die. And that is why you are his hero. It's not easy to die. Isaac is the hero of that story. He's the one that surrendered like a sheep, did not raise his voice. He's the one that did not struggle with the father. That's why he's a hero. And when God is about to kill you, so that you can live in him. And that thing that is holding you back without any struggle, that relationship, that lifestyle, those choices, and you are saying, God, I want to lay it down. I want to surrender to you. And when you die, you come alive and your life become a joy Isaac's story is a classical story of victory over death, over defeat but it happened only through his death, are you willing to die for the Lord so that you can live again the choice is yours as we sing the song this morning before we take the communion if you want to come to the altar for five minutes, I'm not going to pray for you. You're going to come for your own and say, Lord, I want to surrender. If you want to surrender. This is not about giving my life to Jesus now. Because Isaac is a son of Abraham. We know that. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. But have you surrendered everything to him? If you have not, this is an opportunity. Come and surrender everything to the Lord this morning. If you are willing, if you are ready, I surrender all.
want to surrender to the Lord this morning. It could be your marriage. It could be your children. Anything that is holding you back. That is holding you back. It could be an attitude. It could be your pride. Just surrender it to the Lord this morning. It's about you. I'm doing that for myself. Just surrender it now. You've come to the altar. Just surrender it to the Lord now. Surrender it to him now. Surrender everything to him. Unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die, surrender it to him and say, Lord, I let it go. I'm not being forced to do this. I'm not being cajoled to this. I'm not being manipulated to do this. I want to do this. Isaac said it would have been better for him not to have been born than to be born and not do the will of his father. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that has sent me. When Jesus is the all in all, that when people see you and me from today, they will say, indeed, these are Christians. Not because they carry a big Bible. Not because they can pray well. Not because I can quote Genesis to Revelation, but because of the fruit that is coming out of my house and my life. Jesus, help me, Lord. Lord, Jesus, help me, Lord. Jesus, help us, Lord. It's not easy to die, Lord. It's not easy, Jesus. But we want to die. It's not easy with a knife staring at us, oh God. It's not easy not to struggle. But Lord, it's time. Oh God, it's time. It's about time. We can't go through life like this with disobedience. We, we just need to be Isaac, Lord. For a willingly, Lord, we lay it down. We struggle no more from today, Lord. The children are yours. The money belongs to you. The, the life belongs to you. The marriage is yours. <laughs> the habit, oh God, we give it back to you, Lord. We will not go back to it after today, Lord Jesus. We choose to die today, Lord. Father, we give you praise. Father, we exalt your name. We bless your name. Help your children, oh God, to live the resurrected life. Lord, as many, oh God, that willingly die for you today. May they begin to show forth fruit in keeping, oh God, with the righteous power of God. May the same spirit, oh Lord, that resurrected you from the grave, that same spirit that gave Isaac back to Abraham, may that same spirit give us a new life, oh Lord. A new life filled with the boldness of God and the righteousness of God. Father God, we give you praise. Father, we exalt your name. We won't go back to it no more. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Father, we bless your name. Father, we bless your name. This is your body, Lord, that was broken for us. The resurrected body. The one that was crucified before the foundation of the world. The one, oh God, that willingly gave himself for me. The one that hacking onto the voice of obedience. The one that did not struggle with the Roman soldier, even though he could. The one that says, if I, if I want, I would have asked for legions of angels to rescue me, but I wouldn't because this is why I came. I willingly give my life so that you can live again. Father God, may this life of Christ become my life and the life of your children this morning. 
Father God, may we not just say it, may we live it. May we not act it, may we live it. May today, Father God, be the funeral service of our lives and our destiny. May the true life of Christ, oh God, that, that has no hindrance, that resurrected life that nothing can contain, nothing can stop. Sickness can contain it, sickness can stop it. Sin will no longer reign in these mortal bodies because it's dead. It's dead. Father, we sanctify this communion table. We consecrate it. The body of Christ and the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. Instead of my blood, it's your blood that was shed. Instead of Isaac's blood, you took his place, the lamb that was provided. Father, you provided yourself a lamb for the sacrifice. I'm not the sacrifice, but want to live a sacrifice life. We we'll lay our sauce on the altar. We present our body this morning with this communion. We we'll receive grace for holiness, grace for righteousness, grace for peace. The body of Christ broken for you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the glory of the risen Christ rest upon you from today like never before. Father God, as we celebrate together with Esther today, Father God, may that joy that flows from the fountain of your throne, O oh God, just emanate and fill everyone today, Lord. May this week, the 10th day of April, the fourth month, the 16th year, be that day that will forever remember, Lord. Thank you, eternal Father. You can come and take for yourself if you want. And as we keep singing, I surrender.